Hey everyone, welcome to the Corpus Christi show. It's great to be back. I'm with my co-hosts Lois and Mali, and it is our pleasure today to introduce Jason Everett to the show. Jason, thanks so much for being with us today. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me on. Just kick us off in prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Jesus, we consecrate this time to you. We ask that you bless this conversation and bless Jason as he shares the truth goodness and beauty about Catholic Church's teaching on all these challenging moral topics. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So Jason, we've asked uh, a lot of our youth here at the parish their best questions about the challenging topics today in morality. So we're just gonna kick things off. And the first question from our youth today is, why would God make someone with same-sex attraction if it's wrong? Okay, no, it's a very, very good question. Um, one of the things we need to understand is that no one's really born with sexual attraction. And what I mean by that is like, you're not going to find a one-year-old who's attracted to the opposite sex or the same sex or any sex for that matter. Sexual attractions are something that develop later on in our lives. Now, some people experience same-sex attractions for as long as they can remember. You know, like ever since I was like in elementary school, I just remember being drawn to members to be, you know, the same sex. Um, and sometimes what goes on there um, is an actual sexual attraction to the other person, but quite often as well, there's an attraction to another person and it gets sexualized by the world because the world thinks that if you're attracted to somebody, to their personality, to their friendship, to, to whatever, or they have qualities of masculinity or femininity that you admire or you aspire to, that that's a sexual attraction. And so you must be gay, you must be lesbian. And so the world is really quick to over-sexualize our identities, our attractions, our products, our relationships, Everything is amped up when it comes to sexuality. And, you know, I, I sometimes point out that I used to go to a Bible study. There's an 85 year old man in our class and uh, this gigantic beard. And I was completely attracted to this guy. I mean, his sense of humor, his joy, his wisdom. I just wanted to be around the guy because not every human attraction is a sexual attraction. And so even friendships today are getting over sexualized. If two guys hang out a lot, it's like, well, are you guys having a bromance over there? It's like, no, no, this is a masculine friendship. And so first thing we need to be aware of is a lot of times pure friendships are being over-sexualized, which causes people to question their own identity. Another factor at play, I was at a uh, middle school just a couple of weeks ago, and there are only 30 girls in the seventh and eighth grade class, and about 20% of them came up to me identifying as lesbian, which is an extraordinarily high rate, um, you know, compared to the general population. And as I was talking to these five or six girls, um, it really came out that it wasn't that they were like erotically attracted to female classmates. It was just that the boys were disgusting. <laughs> I mean, the boys were Im immature and perverted and gross. And what they've seen about sex on these boys' cell phones and their text messages, if that's intimacy with a guy, well then count me out, I am lesbian. And so what you've got here is a girl in a real pivotal stage of adolescent development and identity quest, you know, getting shown an idea of manhood and of sex that's really broken and twisted and contorted. And if that's what that has to offer me, count me out. In fact, I had known of a, another situation where I met a girl and she had been a, she introduced me to her girlfriend and we had this very pleasant conversation for a good hour or so. And during the talk, all types of topics came up and uh, I had asked her, you know, like, did you ever used to date guys? And she's like, oh, no, I was born a lesbian. I'm like, really? So nothing really turns you away from guys onto girls. And she got kind of quiet. And she said, well, I've been raped four times, if, that, if that's what you mean. And for this poor girl, I mean, her lesbian had become, a, uh, had become like a shield for her heart that she knows what men have to offer. And now she knows what to do to keep them away is to become one of the guys in a sense. And so now I'm not saying by this, that anybody who experiences sexually, you know, attractions of the same sex has been sexually abused, has a bad relationship with their dad or whatever. But there's a lot of factors going on under the surface. And so it's not that God creates us this way or that way, but a lot of times environmental things happen, experiences happen that shape our attractions. Now, is it possible that we could have an attraction to something that's not good? Yeah, I mean, welcome to the human race. I mean, I'm attracted on a regular basis to women who are not my wife. 
is that attraction? Well, God gave that to me. Well, then how can, you know, God be a good God if not all of my desires are perfect? What we need to remember is to have a full understanding, a total vision of man. Pope John Paul II talked about this, and he gave the image of a triptych. A triptych is a picture, like a work of art that has three panels. And when you put your panels together, it shows the fullness of the idea that the artist wished to convey in his images. And so John Paul says, that's kind of like man. There's three panels to who we are. The first is original man who God created us to be in the Garden of Eden, where there was original innocence, there was original happiness, original unity between God and man, between man and the woman, between our body and our souls. But then with the advent of original sin, this harmony, this unity was ruptured, and we entered into a time of historical man, where we experience something called concupiscence, which is kind of these darkened intellects, our weakened wills, our disordered appetites, our inclination towards sin. It's almost like we're leaning in a sense towards sin, but we have Christ's grace to help keep us upright. And then the final period of man is what we're going to experience in heaven, which John Paul called eschatological man, which is our glorified bodies and souls with God for all eternity in heaven. That is the full picture of manhood. Now, of what it means to be human. Now, challenge with being human now is that we're brought into existence in the middle of the period of historical man. And so it's almost like walking into a movie 45 minutes late and trying to figure out well, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, what's the plot. And if we think that a historical man is who God created us to be male and female at the very beginning, we're confusing the state of fallen man with original man. And what I mean by this is if we think, well, I have a desire, then that's how God must want me to act. Well, that was true in the beginning of Adam and Eve. Then we had something called original sin, with the effects of concupiscence. And now all of us have desires for things that might not be in our best interests. We have aches for things that won't ultimately satisfy us. And so we're longing for something good, but often these things can get twisted. And so to understand the full picture of man, that just because we desire something doesn't mean that it's good to act out on that desire. And so we need to pray for the gift of wisdom to ask God, okay, of these desires I experience, which one of these would glorify you for me to act out upon? And unfortunately, for people who experience same-sex attraction, they're told, look, you can either hide in the closet out of shame or come out of the closet, embrace your sexual identity, and forget about God, the church, and the Bible. Do what you want with your body. Gay pride or gay shame, what's your pick? So the idea that there's anything in between is not presented, that you could actually acknowledge that you do experience same-sex attractions and choose to pursue a life of chastity and purity. And this is not a life of neurotic repression and loneliness and misery and self-denial. That's not what the church is inviting these individuals towards. And so I encourage you, if you do experience same-sex attractions, go to our website, chastity.com slash SSA for same-sex attractions. And right on that page, we've got blogs, we've got videos, we've got um, like ministries like edeninvitation.com that are started by young adult Catholic people who experience same-sex attractions and they want to pursue a life of holiness. And they realize that their identity isn't lesbian or gay or bi or straight. Like, no, their identity is that they're beloved sons or daughters of God. And their attractions are something that they experience, but it doesn't define their very identity. And so check out what they have to say. Because, you know, these aren't attractions that I experience, so I don't have a lot of authority to talk on this. But if you watch them and watch their videos and read their stories, you realize that the path of chastity that God is inviting these individuals to is not one that leads to unhappiness because God would not create you for futility. God created you for love, but sometimes abstinence is a tremendous expression of love. And that's not something you often hear about. And so go to chastity.com slash SSA and we have lots of more information on that topic. That's awesome. I love that, Jason. Yeah. Yeah, it just reminds me like the importance of just having a reality check of where we are in the story of salvation history mm -hmm. and to be able to realize like there's a huge difference between what the culture is presenting as the answer for acting upon our attractions versus what the church is presenting. Mm -hmm. To be able to see that, as you've said, like that third way of yeah. what's actually a, a path that's going to bring and truth goodness beauty to to what we actually truly desire and, and what is good for us so 
Yeah, and it's not unrealistic. I think what's unrealistic is expecting people to find fulfillment living outside of the will of God. That is unrealistic. Calling people to heroic lives of sanctity and sainthood is not unrealistic because that's God's plan for each one of us. We just have to trust the heart of the Father to receive the plan that he has for us. Amen. Thanks, Jason. Great. Uh, some questions that our youth also had for you, Jason, um, was speaking about when, when you mentioned the, the twisted ideas that we may have and what Father Richard just mentioned about the I guess the influence that the culture has on our youth. Mm -hmm. Some of our youth have this false understanding that the church hates gay people. Yeah. Is it true? Does the church hate gay people? And I, I wonder then if that might come into the church's view on marriage. Like why doesn't the church allow gay marriage? Yeah, no, two very big questions. I mean, you sometimes see people protesting and they've got their signs, you know, God hates gays. It's like, no, um, God hates your stupid sign. All right, you know, that, that's what he hates because God is love. And he does not have children that he has created that he does not love. And sometimes when you experience same-sex attractions, you experience rejection, sometimes from your own family, sometimes within your own faith community, sometimes even of yourself. And it can be hard to trust, like, like well, how could God even love me when I don't even love myself? You know, and then I go to, I went to that church and they treated me like I was, I had leprosy or something like that, or I went to some Catholic school. And then they made these jokes about me because I was different than the other students. That's not Christianity. Whatever someone has done to you, they have done to Jesus Christ. And so they should be treating you with the same amount of love. And so I apologize if you experience these attractions and you've experienced that type of bigotry and lack of love. On behalf of the church, we ask your forgiveness and your patience. Please pray for us that we can grow in maturity and love to give you the love that you deserve. And so I apologize if that's been your experience of the church. I know growing up, I went to an all boys Catholic high school. And back then it was a culture that would be very much considered homophobic in today's culture where, I mean, a thousand boys. And it was like, I'm not gay, you're gay. I'm not gay, he's gay, you're gay. gay. What we're doing is there's actually a Greek word for that. It's called idiotes. In English, it's translated idiot. That's what we were being. We were so insecure in our own masculinity that we were even afraid to be friends with people who experience same-sex attractions because we thought, well, if I hang out with him at all, everybody's going to say that I'm with him and I can't have that on my, you know, social record. And it was just, we're just super insecure and we are not mature in our faith. And so if you encounter people like that, I'm sorry. Um, in terms of the topic of gay marriage, well, if God loves these people, then why doesn't he let them get married? When it comes to gay marriage, it is not a question of permission. You know, may they do this? It's a question of possibility, meaning what is marriage? For example, if I, if people say, well, I'm in favor of marriage equality. It's like, you're really not. Well, yes, I am. Anyone who loves the other person can get married. Okay, well, I'm going to test you on that. Like, let's say I want to get married, but I want to marry two women. And both of those women want to marry me. We want to, want to enter into a kind of a three-way polyamorous or polygamous marriage. Uh, what do you say? And some people say, well, no, you really need to make up your mind and pick one of the two girls. You can't have both of them. And I pushed back. And I said, no, I thought you were in favor of marriage equality. I mean, if you can have love as a couple, why can't we have love as a throuple? I mean, really, is something really so magical about the number two that it would exclude our love, you know, as if we're going to be some threat to the institution of marriage because we consensually love one another? Are you really going to legislate against our private romantic relationship because of your bigoted laws against us? You can see as you're almost being like bullied into this corner of like you are this, this phobic person that must really hate us because you won't let us get married. And well, I could, I could say, okay, fine. I'll give you the point. I need to pick one of the two. So I'm going to pick this one. But instead of having a marriage that's, you know, faithful and everything, we kind of find monogamy a little restrictive. And so instead of being monogamous, we'd rather just kind of be monogamish, you know, so we're going to have like an open marriage where we think that it would kind of spice things up a little bit to be able to have other sexual partners than each other. And we mutually agree with this, but we will still stay with one another in a marital bond. Is that a marriage? Most people say, well, well, no, fidelity is kind of part and parcel to the marital thing, you know, like kind of monogamy. It's got to be between another person. It's got to be faithful. I say, OK, fine, I'll be faithful to her. But instead of being a lifelong bong, you know, this wedlock, you know, we would prefer kind of something more like wed lease, you know, so like instead of like a lifelong contract covenant, we're going to do like a 10 year plan. And if things are still going good, we'll kind of renew it. And if not, we won't renew. No hard feelings. 
most people say, well, like, well, no, well, no, no, it's got to be a lifelong promise. Okay, now we're starting to get some parameters here. It's got to be between two people. It's got to be faithful. It's got to be monogamous. And, and, and you can see now we're starting to give marriage a form. And the question mm -hmm. is, what is marriage? That's the ultimate thing that needs to be answered. Because if I were to say to you, well, you know, why won't you let these people get married? It's not that I won't let them get married. It's that they don't even want to enter into what a marriage is. And so the word matrimony actually literally means the duty of the mother. It's intrinsically tied to life-giving love. And so just as a human being can only come into existence by means of an act of love between a, a man and a woman, a sperm and an egg, there is no one on earth who exists today by any other means, but by the union of a male sperm and a female egg, that is it. And if it takes the male and the female to create human life, then it wouldn't seem like a big step to assume that maybe that human life deserves his mother and his father. Because adults do not have a right to possess children, but children have a right to their biological parents. You can't swap out a man for a wife. I mean, my wife could not be replaced by a man. She could not be replaced by an army of a thousand men. It, and it's not simply a matter of function. Well, a, a man could take her to school like your wife takes her to school. And, you're, you know, a man could help her if, you, you know, stubs her knee like your wife helps him, puts a Band-Aid on. It's not a ma matter about function. It's, it's about the form of the reality of a mother. And the kids know the difference. I was reading a, a journal of orthopsychiatry where two guys adopted this little boy. And by the time he was five years old, um, this gay couple had to put the kid into therapy because he kept bugging him, asking them, can we buy a mom? How much does it cost to buy a mom? And they put him into therapy to see if they could get rid of this constant nagging des desire he had for maternal love. And so we need to place the rights of the children above the rights of the adults when it comes to establishing and forming families. And in and, and, and just as physiologically, not, it's not just like emotional bonding. When a woman, check this out, when a woman breastfeeds, this is amazing. The woman, the baby will actually backwash a little bit of saliva into the woman's breast tissue. If the baby's sick, as a bacterial or viral infection, the woman's breast tissue, her immune system will immediately detect that the baby is not well. And it will create a pharmacological recipe, like a built-in pharmacy of exactly what that kid needs and will begin pumping more than a billion white blood cells per day into the breast milk. If you pump breast milk from a woman when her baby's healthy versus sick, the breast milk visibly looks different to the naked eye. One is darker than the other because the one where the baby's sick is gonna be darker because it's loaded with these white blood cells and it looks like colostrum. Colostrum mm -hmm. is the, the breast milk that the woman produces the first couple of days after a newborn baby is brought into the world. It's loaded with white blood cells to establish the baby's immune system in this new world of all these brand new pathogens. And so when the woman detects that and, and when the, the baby gets well, her breast will detect the infections gone and her breast milk will resume its normal chemical composition. But it, she'll detect what illness it is. And if she has had that illness before, that particular virus bacteria, she will actually transfer her immunological memory into the baby's body. So it picks up the antibodies of how to fight against these intruders. I read one article that was talking about this and it said, so ladies, if anyone ever shames you for breastfeeding in public, you just tell them you are performing a diagnostic test. And so to me, beautiful, the way that God created our bodies. And to think that I can just have my male partner buy some formula off the shelf at the grocery store, it's basically the same thing as having a wife. I mean, close your eyes. Imagine a husband and a wife in bed with a newborn girl, maybe like, you know, four months old, and the husband's arms around the wife as she's breastfeeding the baby. Put that image in your mind. Now I want you to have in your mind a bed with two men and a four month old baby girl between those two men. Is that the same thing? I think it takes a deliberate act of the will to say it is the same thing because we know in our guts, it's not. The children deserve this maternal love. And so it's not that the church hates these individuals who experience these attractions, it's that the church doesn't even have the authority to redefine marriage. We don't have the authority 
to rewrite the sacraments of what God has given to us. It's not in, in the job description of the Pope to be able to change this any more than he could say, okay, marriage now is allowed for three people or to be temporary or to be you know polyamorous. He simply doesn't have the authority to do that. All we do is deliver the mail, so to speak. We can't rewrite it if the times in which we live in don't agree with it. Wonderful. That was amazing. I, I was just thinking, how would I go about to answer that question? And Jason, all you did was just ask questions back. Like you just asked, what is marriage? Let's get to the definition of it. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have to like bring in so many big words for us to understand. Like, how can we explain this to our youth? And it's really analogously, like you just brought up really great examples and to ask questions from the other side. So thank you for giving us that prime example. Yeah, it's a tough topic and it's one deeply emotional, uh, understandably. And so we need to listen well when we talk to people on these subjects. And we also have to do our homework and to research why does the church teach these things so that we can be able to articulate the church's positions instead of it just being like, oh, I don't know why the church won't let people and give them permission to do that. The church just doesn't have the authority to redefine the sacrament. Mm. Yeah, that, that ties in well to a next question of a lot of youth, they, they feel stuck in like the high school setting in which they're put on the spot. You know, mm -hmm. do you support gay marriage is, oh. a, is a common question that they may get asked. Yeah. And in those kind of uh, situations where they feel stuck, uh, what are the kind of key principles that you would uh, want them to keep in mind when they're faced with those um, hot button questions in a, in a school setting like that? Well, one of the things that you could do is not try to come up with the most perfect answer right there, because that's your only moment you could ever have to give an explanation. If they give you a tough one or a stumper, you say, you know what, um, that's a really good question. And I have some beliefs, you know, and thoughts on it, but I want, give me 24 hours to articulate them. I want to be able to just to, to, you know, to figure out how to word what it is that I believe. Um, 24 hours, let's talk. And buy yourself some time to say, you know, I don't know the best answer for that, um, but just let's circle back tomorrow and let's continue this conversation. And mm -hmm. so they're like, they're saying, okay, he's receiving what I'm giving and he's taking this seriously and he wants to continue this conversation. Mm -hmm. And so this is not a putting the tail between your legs and retreating. It's, you know, there's a lot of difficult church teachings on all kinds of stuff and people get stumped. I get stumped. Like, yeah, why, why is it, what is, how does the church interpret that passage in the old Testament? And how do we reconcile this? Like sometimes mm -hmm. we need time to go to the drawing board, to look it up, to do some research. What do the saints say about this? And then come back with a fuller response. And so don't be afraid. I think that humility goes a long way instead of giving someone some half-baked answer that doesn't even convince you. And it's a great learning opportunity because the best way to learn is to teach. And so when you get stumped and you walk away and you're like, oh, I could have handled that so much better. Okay, now it's time to think, how would you have answered that? Go, do, go read some books on the stuff or read some blogs, go to chastity.com. We've got articles on all this stuff, really in-depth answers to stuff where people are like, well, you know, if infertile couples can get married, then how come gay couples can't get married? I mean, they can't have babies either. How come you guys get married when you, you have a, like a 60 year old couple, they can't have babies, but they can get married. Well, what's my answer to that? Hey, mm -hmm. give me 24 hours. I'm going to go look it up. I'll mm -hmm. be right back. Um, buy yourself the time and just make sure when, when these issues are getting heated, one of the things I think that's important is that the other person walks away from the conversation feeling heard. They feel that you really listen to them, that you absorb, that you actually care what they had to say instead of like, okay, what is my perfect apologetic counterpoint that I can fire back to this other person to disprove what it is that they're saying to me? A lot of times we're just talking past each other. And so I think if they can walk away and know like, wow, that Catholic really listened to me. I didn't think Catholics cared about people like me. That is a seed that you're planting that can bloom into something great years to come. And so just make sure when they walk away, they feel that you, you took their point seriously, you listen to them, and hopefully can open a door for a lot of conversation. And so some of these tough talks are like, well, well, show me what you're reading, and I want to read that, and I'll maybe share with you some of the stuff that I'm reading. And so even if you're maybe not very articulate, you could say, hey, listen to this one five-minute clip from Jason's podcast where he and so-and-so talk about this subject. Listen to that, let me know what you think. And so let us do the talking for you. We had hundreds of videos at chastity.com. Pick any topic, cut and paste it, text it to your friend, and then they can watch that. And then you can talk back and forth. Mm, I like that. I'll use that even as a priest, you know, 
I, I, when I was ordained a priest, I didn't get a perfect knowledge, unfortunately. So a bummer. <laughs> it's always good to have that position of humility for sure. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I really appreciate those points. You're welcome. I think what you what you mentioned, Jason, about having to listen to other people and to talk with people, not at people, or not just talk over people, is a huge thing for our youth. Um, one of the things that also came up with our youth was the use of pronouns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our youth feel like, you know, if I don't use the proper pronouns, I might be disrespectful. I might be labeled as hateful. I think I have to use them. I think I need to respect the other person because I care about this person. And if my friend suddenly wants to call themselves they or them or doesn't want to use he or she, um, I think I have to buy into this. But yeah. then sometimes we have to take a pause and think, do I? Do I have to? How would you answer that? Like, how would we answer that fear of feeling bullied into these kind of ideas? Yeah. It was interesting. Matt Walsh was on the Dr. Phil show last week discussing the topic of gender. And the people are like, well, these are our preferred pronouns. Dr. Phil's, what do you think? And Matt Walsh is like, no, you don't get your own pronouns. It's just like you don't get your own adjectives. It's like me telling you my adjectives are brilliant and handsome. And whenever you refer to me, you need to use my preferred adjectives. It's like, well, well no, uh, language exists in a reality that is not under the control of my subjective opinions and experiences. And so mm -hmm. when it comes to the way that we approach these individuals, we need to understand we have a first priority to God to not bear false witness. And so if you love somebody, you can't lie to them. If you lie to them, then you're in a sense entertaining the delusion that they are them, that they are Z, that they are Zer, that they are any of this new litany of, of, of new pronouns. And we're, I think what they need right now, if you say that you're not going to go along with this, they might resent you. They, they probably will resent you. But you know what? I think they're going to resent you a heck of a lot more five or 10 years from now when they outgrow this and they realize, wait a minute, nobody, even the people from church, even the people that I thought would, you know, lovingly call me out, no one said anything. Any, everybody just kind of went along with this whole thing. Because what's going on with this whole transgender craze right now is especially among adolescents, you're seeing something called rapid onset gender dysphoria, which is more often than not, adolescent girls who often come from middle to upper class families who don't have a lot of experience with real world dating, they're spending a ton of time on Tumblr, on Reddit, on YouTube, watching these trans influencers living in this theoretical world of gender and concepts. And then one comes out as trans. And before you know it, it's another, another. I, I identify as gender non-conforming and I'm this and I'm that. And there, there are these pockets that are just sprouting up and it's spreading like wildfire. The books are being written on this. There's one called Irreversible Damage that talks about this. It's happening like a social cont and contagion in the sense it's very similar to cutting and eating disorders that when bands of girls start doing it, it starts multiplying within these social circles. Now, but the reality is people who experience gender dysphoria, 80 to 95% of the time will naturally come to identify with their biological sex if gender affirmation therapy does not intervene. And what that means is once you have a society that starts beginning endorsing this, the first phase is a social transition. Oh, you want to be called this name? go with that name. You want to change your pronoun or go with that pronoun. You want to change the way you present in your clothes, the restroom you're using. We're going to go along with you. That is the first step of a cascade of interventions that once they start to socially transition, it's like, okay, I've got this battle to fight. You know, okay, everyone's using my preferred pronoun, my brand new name. I'm starting down this path. And then a lot of times like, okay, well, I got to keep going down the path. And so I need puberty blockers or I need cross-sex hormones. Uh, I, maybe I need a double mastectomy. In fact, if you get on, it's heartbreaking. If you go on GoFundMe.com and all you type in is top surgery, which is a double mastectomy. I mean, these are, these are girls who want to have their breasts surgically removed for about $10,000 so that they can no longer identify as female. How many girls are raising funds right now and GoFundMe for that? 40,000 girls are. And they're not getting five bucks here and 10 bucks there. People are dropping two, four, five thousand dollars for these girls to, to, to mutilate their bodies, thinking that that is going to relieve their dysphoria. But oftentimes they go through this procedure. Well, they told me if I go through this, then I can always get breasts back later if I want. 
It's like, it doesn't work like that. You will never breastfeed again, even with implants. The sensation is completely different. And, and then they're like, wait a minute. Now I was dysphoric about my chest. Now I'm dysphoric about my hips because now they look so big and disproportionate because men aren't supposed to have these wider hips. And now that my breasts are gone, that seems to stick out. But my voice is you know, still this. So I need to go on testosterone. But then you go on the testosterone and you're four times as likely to suffer heart disease. And, and it's just this, and you end up becoming this lifelong patient of hormones. And it's like this false summit that you never reach because we can't change our sex. It's impossible. Every cell that has a nucleus in your body is sexed. There are thousands of sex specific genes, meaning your arteries are male or female. Your gallbladder, your esophagus is literally male or female. And so that all that can be done are these expensive cosmetic exterior changes that don't really get to the deeper issues. What is going on here? Why the dysphoria with the body? Because dysphoria is the opposite of euphoria, which is this blissful, peaceful, calm, happiness. A lot of times people feel the opposite towards their body. And they're told by gender clinics, well, the only solution for you is to go on puberty blockers, cross sex hormones, change your pronouns, you know, and then get gender affirmation surgery. And then all your problems are going to go away. Okay, people who do that and go through the surgery, their suicide rate becomes 20, 19 times higher than the general population. And people say, well, well, that's because there are, there are transphobic bigots out there that don't accept them for their new identities. No, the reason why they have a suicide rate 19 times higher than the general population is because 90% of people who commit suicide have a diagnosable medical med, mental health condition. And so to tell these people that we can mutilate your body and the mental health stuff goes away is malpractice. We're contributing with a mental illness instead of actually treating it. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Oftentimes there's autism, there's anxiety, there's depression, there's a history of trauma, there's family dynamic issues, sexual abuse. There's so much going on. And so these individuals who are experiencing gender dysphoria deserve more than this blind affirmation of whatever you think is true. Because in the end, a woman is a person with a female body and any personality not a person with a female personality and any body. Because if we just go car all the way down the line of like, okay, well, if you think you're trans, you're chan trans, you can change your pronoun, change your name. Where, what's the end game on this? Where does this lead society? I mean, look what's happening right now. The, the controversy of Leah Thomas, the, the guy who's swimming, who thinks he's a girl, just shattering all these NCAA swimming races, the girls in Connecticut who aren't getting their full ride scholarships to colleges as track athletes because they're getting beat out by boys in the tournament who think that they're girls, or even more severe, over in Australia, um, Australia, England, even in the US, men can transfer into female prisons now if they declare themselves to be female. And they're getting into these female prisons and they're sexually assaulting the other inmates. There was one man who did this in England. He got he was in the, arrested, put in the male prison. He said, I identify as female. And I'm like, oh, well, if you think you're female, well, send her to the female prison. He got there and he said, well, no, I think I identify as male. And they're like, oh. so it took him so long to do the paperwork. He was getting frustrated and he started to threaten sexual assault to the inmates and to the security guards. And they find, cool, they got him out of there, put him back in the male prison. And he said, mm, I identify as female now. And they're like, what on earth are we supposed to do here? Because gender is not something that just shifts and changes with our moods like they're telling us, that, that now you can affirm this true identity. No, God has given you your identity. Your sex is not something that was just assigned to you at birth. It was a gift from the Father that he wishes to give you, that your body is real, it's reliable, it's not meaningless, it's meaningful. And so your friends who experience gender dysphoria, if you tell them that, you know, I don't feel comfortable using that particular pronoun, what I would say is this. Hey, look, you know, I love you. You know, I, I care about you and I respect you. And I, I think you deserve respect. And I, I think you deserve love, but I also think you deserve uh, the truth. And what I believe is that, you know, when it comes to these pronouns, I don't think pronouns are something that we can just prefer. You know, I, I think biologically we can't change to new sexes. And you know what? You might not want to be friends with me because of that is what I believe. And I hope you don't reject my friendship with you because my beliefs are different than your beliefs because I accept you as a friend. And I love you and I care about you and I respect you. Even though I know we don't see eye to eye on all the gender stuff, I still respect you and I care about you as a human being. 
and I hope that you can see the world is a big enough place for people who have different opinions to still care about each other. But I respect and I understand if you don't want to be friends anymore because we don't see eye to eye on this, I respect your choice if you don't want to be friends with me. And see what you've done is you've put the ball in their court. If you wish to reject me and not be friends with me because my beliefs are different than yours, that's a free choice. I, I, I honor that. You know, I respect that. So no longer are you the bully, you know, trying to like be this transphobic, hateful person. It's like, no, I, I love you and I care about you, um, but I'm gonna shoot straight with you. And I don't believe this is the best approach for you. Um, and I think real friends are willing to be honest with you, even if it means losing the potential friendship. And so you want to take the high road of love because your message is not one of condemnation and hate. It's about loving people enough to tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. That was great. Thanks, Jason. One of the things that speaks so clearly to me when you uh, give us that example of dialoguing with somebody is that you're leading with your heart. Mm -hmm. Because I find so often maybe we're leading, like you mentioned earlier, leading to change their mind or leading um, into this conversation, wanting to win the argument. But we forget so often that this person, there's a heart on the other side of this conversation. This person wants the space to be heard and to be seen. And you acknowledge that right away. You said, I respect you, you're my friend and I love you, yeah. but I'm also not going to lie to you. I thought that was fabulous the way you explained it. Like, if I love you, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, and I'd share with them and say, look, I, I understand that the, the stress you're feeling in your biological sex, that must be really hard, you know? And I don't know what that's like personally. And so I wanna empathize with you, but I also wanna share with you things that you might not have seen yet. And if you just get on YouTube and you just type in detransition, there are literally thousands of videos right now of people who are coming out of all over the world saying, look, I did the hormones, I did the puberty blockers, I did have the surgery, and it was the biggest mistake of my life. And now I want to detransition back to my biological sex, but it's so hard now because I don't even, I had enough stress trying to pass as the opposite sex. Now I've had so many surgical and hormonal you know, changes to my body. I don't even know if I'm going to pass anymore as my own biological sex. And they share openly and honestly about how difficult this journey has been. And so countries around the world are starting to rethink the way that they're approaching the whole thing. Um, the Dutch protocol, which was you know, the earliest one that said, you know, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormone surgery. And now they're like, hold your horses. This is not going well. These girls are now coming back suing clinics saying, look, I, how was I to make an informed decision at the age of 16 to sterilize myself? Like, mm. <clears throat> I'm sorry, like if a woman, a perfectly healthy woman wants a hysterectomy at the age of like 23, you can't even get one. Doctors won't even get to you. But a 15 year old, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I need a little walk, can get a double mastectomy for gender dysphoria. Thankfully, these transitioners are speaking out of this. I'm gonna get a drink of water. Mm. For sure. <laughs> You've been on you've been on a roll, Jason. Yeah. So yeah. you deserve some water. No. No. <laughs> oh, that's great stuff, Jason. Um, I got the forged book here. Great job, by the way, for Thank that. You. Couple okay. of questions leading into that. The first would just be some guys wonder, you know, with masturbation, what's actually wrong with it? Because I guess two rationalizations would be one, like you're not really hurting anyone, and two everyone's kind of doing it so what uh what what kind of message do you have for yeah. young guys out there that are struggling with the topic of masturbation well the real problem is that you're really not loving anybody it's not so much that you're not like hurting anybody i mean you're, you're hurting yourself obviously because god has created the gift of our sexuality for the purpose of babies and bonding the center of the sexual act should be we but masturbation makes the center of the sexual act me it basically teaches me that i've got urges that need to get met and if i've got an itch it's got to be scratched and so if i don't then i'm just going to get neurotic and you know so i've got to have my outlet but imagine this if a man never overcomes his habit of masturbation it's not just a guy issue too i mean girls are struggling with this struggling with online pornography if a guy for example doesn't ever overcome his habit of masturbation i think when he gets married he's not even going to make love to his wife he's going to use his wife's body as an outlet for what he thinks of, of his sexual needs. And trust me, <coughs> sorry, I think a woman's heart can tell the difference. I think she knows the difference between a man who has enough self mastery to make a gift of himself to a woman and a guy who's habitually addicted to what, what used to be called self abuse. 
a woman knows like, is this man really making a gift of himself to me? Or is he just using me because he feels he has these needs that have to get met? And so you can only give if you've uh, obtained self mastery of yourself. And so at any moment, we'll have self-control over our bodies. At any moment, we can control our bodies. We tend to think, oh no, you know, it's too difficult to get these temptations. You have total self-control. Like imagine, for example, it comes like pornography. Imagine a guy and he's sitting in his library at school or whatever, and uh, he's at college and, you know, nobody's around. It's like 11 o'clock at night, you know, library's going to close in an hour. It's been a long day and he's kind of stressed out and he thinks he's kind of entitled to look at a little bit of porn. And so he gets on social media and he starts flipping through some images there. And then I noticed out of the corner of his eye, it's a, a girl, a woman walking by and he's had his eye on her all semester. And he was always hoping for a chance to like to, to meet her and say hello. And in the next five seconds, she's about to walk right behind where he's sitting and she will see what is on his phone. Could you imagine how much self mastery that man would instantly obtain? Shoo, hey, look at that calculus score. I'm studying pre-med to learn to be a pediatric neurologist. Like bam, he'd be off that website in an instant. How did he do that? Where did that come from? Because it was always there. The, the desire for authentic love is always greater than the temptation to lust, but we don't tap into that desire. And so we've got to realize like, this isn't ultimately what we want, you know, to be slaves to our hormones. We want to be able to master our desires so we can, because look, you're either going to control your hormones or they're going to control you. Somebody's got to be in the lead and it's going to be one or the other. A boy gets stuck in that habit of being dictated by his hormones, whereas a man is able to gradually rise above that make get self-control so he can properly love i love that the desire <laughs> the way you put it the the desire for love is always greater than the temptation for lust something like that that, that was very yeah i love that example as well because it, it just resonates so much with the human experience of when you're put in certain situations all of a sudden this this innate desire within you allows you to attain certain mastery to be able to rise above whatever our um, yeah disordered attractions might be because you you know the, yeah the call to to real love is is what is deep in the heart of every single person and we just look forward to those opportunities and we we want to be able to rise up to the situation when they present themselves and, and really. Um, yeah, respond well. So, yeah. Yeah. and I, I've seen it. I've seen it in my own, in my own eyes. Work. I remember when my wife and I. I think we we're dating or engaged. We we're at a shopping mall. I walk into a bookstore, and there's a little huddle of like four high school boys, kind of huddled around some dirty little magazines, a Maxim or whatever Maxim softcore porn magazine. And I noticed the guys. I saw what they're looking at. I said, "Oh, Chris, Liam, do me a favor. <clears throat> Just walk over there." just stand next to him. Don't do anything. You don't even need to talk to him. You don't need to look, just, just go and just stand next to him. I want to watch what happens. She's like, okay. So she walks over there. I mean, as an attractive, you know, 21 year old brunette girl, he stands right next to these high school boys with their little porno mag. And boy, did they vomit that thing up in an instant. It was like, like, like it was on fire and they dropped it. Like, Oh, how about those Chicago Cubs? And they just got up and they left the store. It's like, wow. You know, where did that all come from? the presence of authentic femininity made them reject the counterfeit. And so I think that's the effect that our lady has on us when we grow in our devotion to our lady. I mean, you notice if you're with your buddies, like let's say a nun, you know, walks into the room or whatever church, goes, boom, everybody just kind of stands up a little bit more straight, you know, your, your courtesy, your manners, everything's like up a couple notches. And so I think what we've got to do is surround ourselves with authentic masculinity of real guys, authentic femininity, and, and don't live in the shadows um, because a sin disclosed is half overcome, meaning a lot of these guys are struggling with this stuff. And then they'll tell me like, I've tried for years to break free from porn and masturbation. I've tried everything in this filter and that book and that app. And you're the first person I've ever told. It's like, well, dude, you obviously haven't tried everything. If I'm the first person you've ever told, you need accountability. You need fellowship because they'll be able to call you out and they can, they can even inspire you in ways you can't inspire yourself. I had read of one guy who was addicted to porn and masturbation strip clubs prostitutes everything christian guy married cheating on his wife and he finally opens up to a christian brother and uh and the guy looked at him and said well you know if what you really want to do is look at porn and masturbate then go ahead and do it and his friend was like shocked because he knew this guy was a good christian guy as well 
And he's like, what? And the guy said, yeah, like if what you really want to do is look at porn and masturbate, then go ahead and do it. And his friend just got a pound of the desk and he said, no, that's not what I really want to do. And his friend looked at him and he said, exactly. And the guy, his eyes lit up. Like it was this watershed moment of like, wait a minute, maybe there's something in me that's not all depraved, the evil and wicked. Like maybe there are desires in me running deeper, like a current running deeper than the superficial one to use and to lust. And I need to learn to tap into that so I can be the man who I really want to be. And so these things like porn and masturbation, like we're arguing to keep things that we don't even want in the first place. Like we're getting hung up over things that don't even satisfy us. Because the longer we get hooked on that stuff, it's like C.S. Lewis said, it's the law of ever greater craving with ever diminishing reward. That the first time you look at porn and masturbate, it's like there wasn't a huge craving, but there was this gigantic reward of like, wow, I've never experienced that before. But then as time goes on and you entrench in those habits, the, the reward just starts to go down. But the craving gets greater and greater, and it causes just this restlessness where we keep going back to that which is never going to satisfy us, trying more ways and more often and more perverse ways of how, because why can't I get that high? It's like any drug. With that abuse, the tolerance changes, that you're we're rewiring the circuits of our brain because that's not what the type of bonding that we're created for, this mental polygamy that won't ultimately satisfy us. Oh, that's a great answer. Love it. And I love how we're recording this. So we can use it again with more guys. So it's great, Jason. Thank you. Really. Um, go going back to a little bit about what you said about the, the presence of authentic femininity, I can't help but jump at that because I'm thinking, yeah, all the more reason that women need to strive to be chaste and need to be pure. Um, but those are really big words. What does that look like for our youth today? Um, how do we live out chastity? Why is that important? Is that something more of our parents' generation, you know, in a world where we, like society kind of normalizes safe sex practices like birth control and condoms and sex before marriage? Is chastity now out the window? Does that still matter? Is it important still? What are your uh, thoughts on that? It's as important as love is because chastity frees you to love. Chastity mm -hmm. frees you to know if you're even being loved. Because look, I mean, from a girl's perspective, like what you win a man with is what you keep him with. I mean, if you win him with pleasure, then you have to keep him with pleasure. But here's the problem, you can get pleasure anywhere. You can get it off the internet, you can get it from another girl, like it's a repeatable asset. If you win him with your body, um, then you kind of have to keep him with your body. But here's the problem, like every woman has a body. I can't even remember the last woman I met who did not have a body. I, like this is a repeatable thing. But if you win him with who you are as a human being, the relationship is far more likely to go the distance. And so what chastity does is it tests the person's love. Like, do you love me? Do you want me? Or do you only want the pleasure that you're getting from me? Because if a guy won't date you, if you won't send him some pics and hook up with him and doing this and that, it's not you he even wants to begin with. He wants the pleasure that he's trying to get at your expense. And so chastity is this tremendous asset for discernment of women of does this guy love me? Does he want me? Or does he just want to get pleasure from me? And so it tests their intentions, but it also frees you to love. Because if you can't say no to your sexual impulses, then saying yes to them really doesn't mean anything. And so I think one thing that women can do to help in this front is the topic of modesty. Now, modesty is not simply your outfit. We make a big mistake as culture if we reduce modesty to nothing but clothing. Because if we do that, girls, for one, get very reasonably resentful over that message. Because it's like, when was the last time you heard a modesty talk for guys? Never, like ever. It's like always the girls. And so that creates resentment. And the reason why I don't hear male modesty talks is because we just think modesty is clothing. And guys are like, oh, I got pants on, you know, we're good day. You know, like what more else is there to it? Hey, well, you know, maybe what's a lot more immodest than her outfit is your intentions with her before that date. That was a much graver form of immodesty than the pair of jeans that she was wearing. Uh, but it always gets put on the woman. And so women get resentful towards the message because it's always her fault, right? I mean, you were wearing that outfit, you know, you are the seductress, you are the occasion of sin, you are the woman caught in the act of adultery, it's the woman. It's been this way for thousands of years, but we've got to really realize that what is the actual cause of lust? I mean, think of it this way. What is the cause of robbery? Is the cause of robbery the presence of jewelry in the window of the store? Or is the cause of robbery the presence of greed in the heart of the robber? 
Jewelry does not cause robbery. Greed does. In the same respect, the cause of lust is not the beauty of the human body. The cause of lust is the heart that does not realize what the body is inviting you to, which is authentic love. And so John Paul II even said that as we grow in purity, get this, he says you actually come to an ever greater awareness of the gratuitous beauty of the human body and its masculinity and femininity, and this beauty becomes a light to our actions. I even heard one Orthodox theologian said, beauty is the only thing that can make the eye chaste or pure. Mm -hmm. And it was like, whoa, that is rich. What he's saying at is that real beauty draws you out of yourself to aspire for something noble and sacrificial. Because when you talk to a guy about, you know, the, the woman he dreams of marrying, he doesn't think about getting some from her. He thinks about giving himself completely for her. That idea, that ideal of authentic human love makes us want to rise up to become worthy of it. And so when a woman dresses in a way that is modest, it's an unspoken invitation of love and respect and of reverence. It's not because your body is bad. It's because your body is so good. It's so good, it's not meant for strangers. It's so good that if you show too much of it, it'll actually have the unintended effect of eclipsing your value as a person. Your sexual value begun, begins to move in front of your personal value that can hardly see out of it. And so what the guys are after is the physical value when what you really wish they'd love you for is the personal value. And that's why John Paul II says that modesty opens up a way towards love. And so it invites you to be loved for all the right reasons. Fantastic. Thank you, Jason. If anything, listening to you speak about chastity gives me hope for what true love really is versus what society tells me what love is, which is instant gratification and the, like the pleasurable things right at the tips of your fingers versus what chastity really promises, which is, which is that true and beautiful love. So thank you, Jason, for speaking to that. If it's, when, you, when you really show what God's plan for love is, I mean, I always say it just makes lust look boring. I mean, it really does. And, you know, one thing that I point out, John Paul II in his um, Theology of the Body uses this phrase, um, the peace of the interior gaze. And what he's talking about there was originally when God created Adam and Eve and that original innocence, Eve, um, I mean, they're naked, <clears throat> there's no shame. And they weren't shameless because they were like two kids in a bathtub that didn't even know they're naked, you know, or some like isolated jungle tribe. Well, I didn't even know I didn't have pants. Like that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the, the original nakedness they had, the shamelessness they had was the result of their union with God. Their hearts were so pure that when Adam looked at Eve's body, he didn't see it as some thing to be used for selfish gratification. He mm -hmm. saw in her body his calling to love her as God loves, this gift of life-giving love, this gift of himself to her. And if he was seeing in her God's love, then what shame would she feel? None, she was being looked at rightly. She had what John Paul said, all of the peace of the interior gaze. But when lust entered the picture, we began covering ourselves because it's a natural reaction. I think women can tell when a man is looking at her wrongly, when he's looking at her lustfully, not just up close. I think women can probably perceive that from a hundred yards away. It creates in our heart this kind of restless vulnerability, this resentment toward men, toward sexuality, and she closes off a bit. Um, but when John Paul is talking about it, is that as, as a guy grows in purity, you can actually bless your bride, your wife, with all of the peace of the interior gaze. And when you hear that, it's like this echo of Eden that we begin to feel in our hearts. Like, ooh, that's what I want. I mean, every woman would be like, yes, yes, yes. That, that, that's how I want to be looked at. Forget how I want to be touched or forget how I want to be held. Like, that's how I just want to be seen by a guy. And every guy upon hearing this would be like, yeah, I want to give my wife that. I want to give her that peace. I want to look at her rightly. And so when you really start to get into the deepest cravings, it's not for looking at some pornographic image on Snapchat. Like that's not the deepest craving. That's like, you know, eating out of a dumpster. That's like being floating at sea and thinking you're going to satiate your thirst by drinking salt water. I mean, it's just going to make you thirstier. The real thing you want is something good and true and beautiful, but it demands sacrifice. That's what makes it rare, but that's what makes it so beautiful and worth it. Just uh, wrapping up here, Jason, there was one more 
kind of lighthearted question. If, if you could spend one day with JP2, like if he came back right now, he was in his prime, what would you do with him? I'd go hiking with him. I'd go up in the mountains. We would just talk. I'd go to confession with him, spend some time in Eucharistic adoration with him. Um, uh, we're actually doing a, a pilgrimage this uh, summer to the Holy Land. I just got the notice today that Poland has opened its borders. Uh, vaccinated, not vaccinated, come on in. As long as you don't have COVID, doors are open. And so we're actually gonna do a pilgrimage with him uh, this summer and Father Agostino Torres walk in the footsteps of JP2. So um, yeah, we would just do a lot of talking. We do some hiking, we do some praying, go to confession with him, celebrate mass with him. Uh, uh, that may be a dream come true. And I, and I got to experience those things. I didn't get to go hiking with him, but um, did to get to spend time at his mass, receive his blessing. Um, absolute hero of mine. And if you want to find out why, uh, we wrote a book on it called St. John Paul the Great, His Five Loves. Read it. Um, yeah. I mean, you're going to fall in love with this guy. I mean, he was a spiritual giant, but so down to earth and funny and humble and holy. So Mm -hmm. I read that book in seminary and it was a real inspiration for me and a lot of other guys in STEM. So yeah, thanks for putting that together. That was, a, that was a really good book. Thank you. A great, yeah, a great intro to JP too. So mm -hmm. yeah, for the youth out there, that'd be probably my top book to recommend for uh, like an intro for JP too. So Ah, there you go. I would say that Father Richard showed a book and I wanted to show my favorite book too. And it's one that Jason, you wrote. Um, so St. John Paul the Great and his five loves, it's actually what jump started my admiration for the saint. I didn't hear much of him until I, I read this book. I was introduced to this book by a friend and I gobbled it all up. I could tell how much you love the saint through the stories that you share about his life. I've never read about them anywhere else except through this book. And then from there, I really wanted to dive into what John Paul II wrote about, what he spoke about. And from and I, I learned about the beauty of women and the dignity of life. And I was just so entrenched in his teachings and all thanks to your book for jumpstarting that for me, Jason. So I echo exactly what Father Richard said to all of the youth and anyone really watching this to go get yourself a copy of the book and see why this great saint is called great for a reason. Yeah, and you know, all I've done for the last hour is basically plagiarize him. I mean, that's our whole <laughs> ministry is just taking his love and responsibility book and his theology of the body and just making it accessible for people to realize like, wow, this is, this is really beautiful. Like that, this, this is easy to share in the sense that it's not just this litany of regulations and rules, but really God's vision for what he created us for, because in the end, nothing else will really satisfy. Amen. Jason, just to conclude, could you give a, a message to the youth out there? Just a call to become saints, whatever you want to say. And then you could uh, close us with the final prayer as well. Yeah, I, I would say if, if you want to become a saint, create room for silence in your life. Um, so much noise from the minute we wake up, just boom, screens, input, input, input. We got the earbuds in, the beats by Dre, the talk, 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 the chatting, the texting, the DM, da -da, and go to bed. Instagram, live, reels, da -da 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 bed. It's like, how does God even is supposed to speak to us? And then when we do talk to him, we're just rambling because our minds are so cluttered. I remember one saint said, he said, how can you expect God to listen to you, what you're saying, when you aren't even listening to what you're saying? <laughs> and so we got to pause. And then when we go into prayer, speak slowly to him, make time to listen. And you don't always hear anything there. But if you get in the habit of making room and space in your life for God to speak to you, he will. And it might not be like in that moment, because usually the fruit of prayer, you don't experience during prayer, but the fruit of prayer becomes undeniable if you persevere in prayer. And so you will live as you pray. And so do your morning prayers, get some evening prayers, spend some time in Eucharistic adoration, pray a daily rosary if you can. And it's not ultimately about doing all these things. It's about creating room in your life to receive, which is ultimately what prayer is. It's a receptive act more than it is just an active act. I did my prayer. I did my liturgy hours. Yeah, we've got to do our part, but we've got to make room to receive and listen because as St. John Paul II said, every person who seeks the kingdom of God will find themselves. And so let's wrap up in prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you for the gift of life and for this hour that you've given to us. And we pray that it would bear fruit for eternal life. Um, we pray for all the people that will see this video, um, that it'll stir up in their hearts now and in the days and weeks and years to come, uh, just to inspire them to allow themselves to be loved more fully by you, God, to receive your love and to trust you, to trust your plan for their lives, for their hearts, for their souls, and even for their bodies. 
And we entrust all these desires to our lady as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Paul II, pray for us in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.